Oh, dear bros, and today we're going to be talking about the mob and the mass on, di on differences between collectives forming to destroy givens and collectives forming because of givens. And this is a precursor to the essay, Belong Again, as featured in the book. And the paper is going to be making a distinction between mass and mob. Um, a mob is something you can associate with, say, the French Revolution, uh, you know, these kind of collective movements against a system that is defined as oppressive or an institution or something like that. Um, while the mass, I will associate with the banality of evil, something that results from social givenness. And what Hannah Arden talks about, you know, she talks about how with, um, with how Eichmann, he was just doing his job to send the, the Jews off to the um, concentration camps during the Holocaust. It was just part of his everydayness. He didn't think about it. There was a kind of thoughtlessness to his, act, to his actions. And Belonging Again talks a lot about how it is social givens that create thoughtlessness and how these can be very oppressive. You know, if it's just part of your culture to mistreat a certain people, then you're not even mistreating those people, right? You're just doing what you ought to do. It's just what defines your everydayness. So that is the mass. That's the problem of the mass. Now, very often, say, movements will in history arise against that mass precisely to stop the injustice and to free the minorities and different people who are oppressed by the mass. But then that runs the risk, that very effort runs the risk of becoming a mob, which can destroy societal givens that are necessary to hold the society together. Without givens, society loses shared intelligibility. It, um, it, it atomizes and individuals can no longer relate. And generally today we exist in a world that is very atomized. Um, now that lowers the, pro the probability of Nazi Germany and the banality of evil, but it increases the likelihood of a mass. Because when people are individualized, but they also don't want to um, join an institution or be um, told what to do by authorities, but humans still look for community and relationships and they still look for like a meaning and a purpose and something to kind of guide their actions. Well, then they tend to be very susceptible to joining a mob or a mob movement. We can also associate the mob um, with the Dionyses that Nietzsche will talk about. And you could, uh, you could associate Ap Apollo with the mass. Um, and there's this quite, you know, that, you know, Dr. Hamelik will say that Nietzsche could lead you to the mob and that that could certainly be true in the same way that the iconoclast and uh, Samuel Barnes can lead to the mob. But there's also the other side where the dogmatists following Mr. Barnes can give you the mass in the same way. And I don't think that Nietzsche at all would support Nazi Germany, the mass of, say, Nazi Germany. But you could make the argument that the very iconoclastic nature of Nietzsche could lead to a collapse of social givens that gives rise to Nazi, um, to Nazi Germany, where the mob leads him to the mass. Now, the counter to this would be to say that Nietzsche doesn't so much support deconstructing given so much as he's just saying given are destroyed that God is dead it's not that Nietzsche killed God he's just saying hey God is dead it's more like Christians killed God frankly because they no longer believe in him so you know it depends on how one wants to critique Nietzsche but there is an argument to be made that Nietzsche can lead to the mob now what's interesting is these categories don't necessarily I'm not saying these are kind of sharp categories because you could argue that Nazism started as a mob right it was a small movement that kind of um rose up and and you even have the the night of shattered glass there's a lot of mob activities but that eventually led to a mass um and and certainly masses can also lead to 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 mob like activity big collectives so you know the opening line of the paper is perhaps all collectives in similar in consequence but they are not identical in origin and i think it's really important to identify that even if mass can lead to mob and mob can lead to mass, that they're not the same in how they start off. Because if we don't realize that, we might think we can avoid the dangers of a mob by creating the conditions of a mass, which can lead to a mob, ironically, as we can think we can avoid the problems of the mass by having the conditions of a mob. Um, and, and ultimately, these can lead one into the other. And if we don't know that, then we might think we have found solutions to our problems which um, are not solutions at all. So it's important to get this distinction uh, precisely so that we can rightly identify a solution, quote unquote, or a way to manage our situation um, as opposed to mislead ourselves. The paper is going to also say that we can associate the mob with the sublime in Burke, 
which you could even say is a manifestation of the pleasure pish principle unre unrestrained by the reality principle, which is from Freud. Well, you could say the mass is a moralization of beauty, symmetry, harmony at the expense of the people. So that's a Berkian distinction. Um, and, and you can also say that thinkers like Foucault is warning about the dangers of norms and sanity and uh, sexual norms as possibly generating the oppression of the mass, whereas someone like Burke or Tocqueville and some of the other conservative thinkers are warning about the dangers of the mob. So, uh, you know, we can go through history and look at different thinkers. Now, there's a paper called How Freud Unites Inception, Hannah Arden and QAnon, as there's another paper on what does Strauss have to do with Arden, and those would be two pieces that show how we end up in mobs and also how mob and mass um, go together. You know, I would argue that the German nihilism of Strauss is a kind of mob-like effort to return to values and virtues and quote-unquote givens. So it's a desire to return to the conditions of the banality of evil. And I would say that German nihilism and the banality of evil are not opposites, but that Strauss leads to ardent. Um, and Arden can lead to Strauss, of course, because here's the thing. When people create a mass, they create a banality of evil. Then a minority of people or a group of people can oppose that. And that could over, um, it's not that that's wrong, it can overfit and lead to a, um, a mob. So there's that piece in, um, in uh, The Absolute Choice about overfitting and underfitting. How if we try to use Aristotle's logic today, we're kind of overfitting Aristotle because we, we need to use Hegel. Um, and, and, and you could say, and it, the terms kind of blur as well, because you could say that using, um, using Aristotle is, uh, is applying him today. It just won't fit. There's a kind of underfitting that occurs. Uh, but I, th I think a better way to look at it is we're overfitting, we're extending the logic of A is A when we really need to be using um, Hegel. Well, in the same way, what can happen is in opposition to a, a mass, the, uh, the conditions of a mob can form that are actually really good as long as the mob doesn't overfit and become a new mass or it tears everything down without any idea of what to replace it with, which is a way to think about the French Revolution. You know, the French Revolution is very justified. I mean, there's oppression and there's, um, you know, corruption. And so opposing the church and the government was not wrong. The problem is um, the revolution succeeded and didn't exactly know or have an idea of what to replace it with. Thus, you had the reign of terror until Napoleon comes in and seizes it. And you have a similar, you know, you could go through history and see many examples examples of revolutions um, failing, uh, either going too far or not being ready for success. Um, and this is very difficult. So we have to somehow navigate this middle, this middle, uh, this middle space between mass and mob. We, we must tread in the slim rod on which we balance is made of glass. It's basically invisible. Uh, the paper will also talk about the Stanford prison experiment a little bit because that's an interesting blending of mass and mob. Um, and ultimately, it's going to be framing why um, society is so tragic, why dealing with sociology is such a trade-off of competing goods, and why our situation is so difficult and complex, and, um, and why we have to think anew. And this will now lead into the essay, Belonging Again, which will hopefully expand on this point and approach it from different angles in hopes of focusing in on what exactly it is we need to do so that we can manage our situation because we're never going to solve it away. For more by OG Rose, please visit ogrose.com. You can find the playlist for Belonging Again on YouTube and there's a list of the entries to Belonging Again thus far on Medium. And thank you so much for your time.